Live from University Park, this is Nini Talk. I'm your host, Neela Azami, and today we'll be diving into what is currently taking place in Israel and reviewing Taylor Swift's big week, including the premiere of her new movie and date weekend in New York City. We'll also be looking at the top five worst horror tropes, the most intriguing conspiracy theories, and cheaper alternatives to some of the most well-known cosmetic products on social media. Now let's get talking. Welcome back to Nini Talk. We're going to send it over to the politics panel to discuss what is currently taking place in Israel today. Olivia, take it away. Thanks, Neela. I'm Olivia Jean, joined here today by Jace Obardo, Francie Ebert, Ryan Lawi, and Yeya Wan. Today, we discuss the devastating attack on Israel, which prompted a war against Hamas. This conflict has been brewing for years. We share our reactions, break down years of history, and discuss the future of the Middle East. I mean, it's been a crazy 10 days. Yeah, when I first heard the news, I was very shocked. Um, shocked, but not surprised. What do I mean by that? Shocked because of the scale of the attack and how many lives it took, but not surprised because of the long and very contentious history between Israel and the Palestinians. I mean, if you look at the history, which we will in just a couple moments, it's very clear that this was going to boil over and it was not going to be pretty. Yeah, I think just like the rest of the world, kind of it's awful to see, and especially for people our age and even our parents' age, it's hard to kind of grasp the thought of like the Holocaust, for example, because it was so large scale and it just like so awful that it's nothing that you thought you would ever see again. And then for people our age who some of us weren't even alive for 9-11, we never thought we'd see destruction and terror on that scale, yet we're seeing this. So it's it's awful that that's all it can be boiled down to basically. It was during a religious festival of happiness where it all broke out, which was very unfortunate. Uh, it was the deadliest day in history since, uh, well, for the Jewish population, it was the deadliest day in history um, since the early 1900s. We know what happened with Hitler, stuff like that. It was just a terrible situation. And of course, my heart goes out to everybody who lost their lives, needs an amputation, lost a loved one. I mean, the Jewish population is only 16 million Jewish people. And, you know, everyone was impacted in some way. And, you know, it was really, it was just not a good situation across the board. I think when we, we talk about this event, you know, about 10 days ago, the complexity of this attack is really, really intense. I think people aren't really aware of how the buildup was with this. Um, we've never really seen anything like this within the past y couple 50 years, as you just said. With the Jewish population? Correct. Yes. Um, I mean, there was a land, air, and sea invasion. Um, not as, it's just, it's hard to put into words, you know, how, how does, how does one deal with these kind of situations personally, you know, like, also just, you know, seeing what's happening on the news, seeing both sides of the story, I think that's also really, really essential. Mm -hmm. There's only so much that gets covered. Um, it only gets worse, too. The hospital situation that happened on the 17th, which is our day of filming this, was just an absolute disaster. 500 people died, both sides placing the blame. You know, just not good. There was a school that was attacked. Six people were killed. They were seeking refuge in the town. Just not a good situation. My first reaction was shock as well. I think it was such a complex attack, clearly planned. It couldn't have just ha like been planned the day before. Like this was months in the making. Um, and I had the chance to talk with um, some experts um, throughout since this has all happened since the attack and 
A terrorism expert told me that um, Israel is considered the best in the country for counterterrorism. So it comes as a shock because Israel knows exactly how to defend themselves. They've got a great system going on. They protect their borders really well. They have great um, air space control, all of that. And so people are baffled that Israel didn't kind of see this coming. Um, Israel's the, Iron Dome, if you were going to yes. talk about how like, strong their military and defense is, their Iron, Iron Dome is 96% effective. And if you look at any like live shots of reporters on the ground there, you're seeing fire going through the air and the missiles it's, it's getting... It's crazy. Well, I've been honestly very interested in this Iron Dome situation. I wish that we could kind of implement something in the United States kind of like that because it is very effective. You can, you'll see the live videos of the reporters there with the, the dome, the rockets hitting the dome and just bouncing off basically. So it's really, it seems to be really effective. Obviously, uh, we've still had people die and, and stuff, but the Iron Dome has saved a lot of lives in Israel. Well, Israel practices mandatory conscription, and alongside that, they also have a lot of people from the reserves or people formerly in the reserves coming back in to serve. I mean, people as old as 60, 70 trying to help out the cause, and on the other side, Gaza is trying to do everything they can. I mean, they're living in poverty on that strip. Million, over a million people. I mean, there's different, there's disputes of how many people actually live on the Gazan Strip, but it's safe to say it's gotta be at least a million people it's on two, that strip. It's two million. Yeah, um, it's and two it's million. the size of Philadelphia. Philadelphia has 1.4 residents that live in Philadelphia. In the Gaza Strip, there is two million people, um, and their entire resources come from out, outside because they're, they're surrounded by water, Egypt, and Israel, right? That is where they're located, so all of their food, water, all of these things, their basic human needs come from the outside. They're not really able, one, they don't have the land space, and two, they just don't have the type of land to be able to grow a lot of different crops and, and Only make their own food. Only 141 square miles. And, and that's, that's unfortunate. I mean, there's 80% of the residents there are in poverty. Um, Two-thirds of them are under the age of 25. So it's basically a million, over a million kids living there and then adults and so it's it's just devastating on both sides people are dying and and right to add to what you were saying yeah uh, israel cut off their water and electricity not only that it's only 141 square miles the entire strip also 40 percent of those hospitalized mm -hmm. are children right and so this for me ties into media coverage of this entire conflict i mean if we're just looking at it objectively we can tell that there is one side that has so much more capabilities, not just in terms of military, but just in terms of manpower, in terms of development. Yep. Um, Israel has the most powerful country in the world backing them. And like you said, two thirds of people living in Gaza are under the age of 25. So for me, seeing the language that's been used around this conflict has been very disturbing mm -hmm. to say the least, because I feel like there hasn't been that consideration into it and so it's very important how we treat this conflict. And language is so important. And we all know this as people going into journalism, as people going into politics. So something that's been really disturbing to me is just seeing the media coverage of it. Yeah. For civilians. Like this, yes. this, is, this is something when we look at the civilians of everyone in these, both of these places. You know what I mean? Like I was reading, and Egypt is facing pressure to open up their crossing. They um, actually did already. Oh, OK. Um, but it, I don't know if that's going to work. It was it was the a temp people, it was temporary. The people of Gaza have nowhere to go. They and the can't destruction go anywhere. Of the the only, their biggest border is, causing, is Israel. Right. So they're trapped pretty much. Um, well, and the other thing I'd say is the fact of the matter is the bad people behind this are Hamas. They're a terrorist organization. Can, Their goal yes. is to instill fear mm -hmm. in the general population. And the fact that this attack was such a surprise should be concerning for a lot of people mm -hmm. because we're talking about how strong is Israel's military is. It shouldn't, it shouldn't have been a surprise, but it was. And um, Hamas is a State Department sanctioned terrorist organization. So they're part of the Palestinian government. And the only way that this is gonna get solved is until Hamas is eradicated out of their government. Right, right. but if you look it's at the holding. history of Hamas as well, a lot of people 
don't know that Israel itself had a part in the creation of it. Um, Abner Cohen, who was a retired Israeli official, once said in an article in the Wall Street Journal in 2009, Hamas, to my great regret, is Israel's creation. This is a direct quote from him. And again, I am a huge proponent of making sure you know the history behind each conflict. So as terrible as what Hamas has done is, it's very important to me for Israel at least to acknowledge their hand in this. And mm -hmm. as the bigger power, the more powerful entity in this conflict, there has to be some give and take. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't justify violence, of course, but it's important to note that like, when we are, when we do learn about these things and history comes into play, it it piles on top of each other. And, and to add on to that, um, like I said, I was able to talk with a couple experts in the field, and one professor who studied, studies Middle East um, history said that we should look at Israel to because they have the power, they have they are dominating right now. They have the resources, like you mentioned, they have they're backed by so many different countries that they should be the ones to try to make peace talks. And I found that really interesting because they were the ones that were initial, initially, uh, initially attacked, excuse me. Um, but who knows, this, this is a very complicated situation and there's no, um, end, in sight. There's no end right now. And we didn't even get to the hostage situation. We, there's so many, so many different aspects and we, we cannot fit it all in. Um, so to be continued, um, we're going to take it back to you, Neela. Thanks, Olivia. All of our prayers go out to everyone affected in these tragic times. Up next, our entertainment panel will recap one of the biggest weeks for Taylor Swift. Stay tuned. <laughs> You're just not hooked. Ooh, yeah, I'm just not hooked. You'll be hooked yeah. soon. Okay. Okay, okay. After, after this after discussion. This discussion. Yeah, after yes. This. Oh, okay. Welcome back to Nindy Talk. Whether Taylor Swift was a staple to your music taste while growing up, or you're more of a recent Swifty, I think it's pretty safe to say she will always have her place in the music world. Let's send it over to our entertainment for the latest update. Courtney, over to you. Thank you so much, Neela. I'm Courtney McGinley, joined here today with Emma Goldkopf, Jake Santora, Emily McGlynn, and Abby Shashoot. Now, we all know too well, but Taylor Swift once again broke the internet with Taylor Swift The Eras Tour concert movie being released just a couple of days ago, her surprise cameo on Saturday Night Live, and date nights with Kansas City Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey. New York was definitely waiting for her. <laughs> now, before we get into all of it, I think we should go around and say what eras we are dressed as. So, I am dressed as... Reputation. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in my Reputation era, and it's also my favorite album, so that's why I chose to pop off in the, the Reputation fit. Love that. I am dressed as lover. <laughs> I was actually looking in my closet, and I had a lot of red, but you know what? I found a perfect combination to make a lover outfit work, and so I ran with it. Nice. I'm Evermore. <laughs> and I really just, I'm wearing my roommate's turtleneck. I thrifted this jacket, but I think I've got it all together nicely. I mean, it's, it's a pretty good up, and it's fall. It's perfect. It is perfect. Um, I'm fearless. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was the first CD that I ever bought was the fearless, um, not the Taylor Swift version, unfortunately, but the, the original. So I decided to pop out with, with the yellow one. And I am dressed as Midnight. Um, <laughs> that was good. Gonna, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna be honest, like I'm not like the biggest Swifty, but like when this first album came out, I was like, eh, okay. But some of the tracks like really grew on me, and I'm just like, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely absolutely. With Is there a reason why you're not a big Taylor Swift fan? I don't know. She's just like. She's cool and everything. I just <laughs> you're just not hooked. Yeah, I'm just not hooked. You'll be hooked yeah. too. Okay. 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 After, after this after discussion. This discussion. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so as we know, on October 11th, she had her world premiere with the concert movie, and she went to the Grove in LA. And something that's super cool, she had the mall right next door completely shut down. But I think just because we talked about our outfits, we should talk about her wonderful blue outfit. Oh she was popping off, to oh, say the least. Was. She looked like an absolute princess, literally. Yes. The light blue and just how it flowed on her. Oh, yeah. oh my mm -hmm. God. Very so 1989 Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. It's beautiful. I mean, I might get a little bit of hate for saying this. It does look sort of like a 
when you make the snowflakes in kindergarten and you cut oh, out yes. the little stuff. Yeah. But I mean, I it's probably $8,000 Oscar <laughs> little rented dress. <laughs> I know it wasn't. I mean, cut up by children. But I love it. Like, I think it's perfect. But that, I first saw it and I was like, interesting vibe. But I love it. And the colors, I completely agree. Yeah. She was very enchanted. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. I Snaps. see. Oh my gosh. So also, speaking of the huge premiere, what do we think of her speech? that she gave, first of all, she just waltzed into the theater and then gave this awesome speech. So what do we think about that? I think, I mean, she was so genuine with it and I thought it was really funny. She mentioned in her speech that she can't believe that music is her career and that she thinks it's crazy. And I think that's crazy because music has been her career mm -hmm. for so long. I mean, she's been an artist for 30 plus years now and I mean, does she even know the impact she's having? I think she obviously does. Mm -hmm. But that was just really funny because I think that humanizes her a lot more because people are like, oh, it's Taylor Swift. Like, she's this massive music artist. But she's a human. Like, mm -hmm. she has feelings mm -hmm. like all of us. Like, I just thought that it was really cool how she mentioned that in her speech. No, yeah, and it kind of makes me wonder, like, during her teenage years when she was, like, writing music, you know, singing with her guitar and everything, what was she thinking? Like, maybe she was thinking, oh, this is, like, a short gig, something that I like to do, and then she's going to go to college, graduate yeah. with, yeah. what, a medical pre-med degree or something. Mm -hmm. But no, yeah, I think it's like so amazing that she got to like grow up and like really just live her dream. Yeah. Like, and the beauty about her music that I've always taken away from other artists is that even with all of her albums, each one appeals to what it represents someone. Mm -hmm. Any any kind of audience, whether you're a Taylor Swift fan or not, if you listen to those lyrics, in some way, shape, or form, there's going to be at least one song that relates to you, and you can you know relate yourself with. I think that's just amazing. I know for one, like. Plenty of songs like Never Grow Up from Speak Now, which is mm -hmm. oh, arguably my favorite song from her. I always think about that one. And I kind of relate it to my own life. And I just know I, I got to be one in a million people mm -hmm. that feels the same way. And I think that's what's so beautiful about her evolution is I don't think she had any idea like what she was doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? She was kind of mm -hmm. just making music because that's what she was feeling. That's what was going on in her life. And she figured that it could apply to someone else someday. And it did. Um, and I think that's what's going to make her so primitive in mm -hmm. music is just this natural progression of eras and I'm excited to see what she does going forward. Um, I think that's the one thing that I'm looking forward to when she's done re-recording all these albums is like what is Taylor Swift going to look like going forward now that she has reflected with this Eras Tour concert film. Yeah, Absolutely. definitely. Yeah. I know she's helped me through a lot, especially this oh, yeah. year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, not only that, I feel like she's just the most selfless person. I know mm -hmm. in her speech she was talking about all of her fans, all of the people in her crew. She was like, I couldn't thank them enough. Mm -hmm. And obviously she's such a superstar, but yeah, she couldn't have done them, done it without their fans. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. even her truck drivers. Mm -hmm. She was yeah. thanking yeah. them profusely. Yeah. I think she did. I read somewhere that she gave them like, a lot of, a big a hundred thousand, it was a hundred thousand? Um, yeah, oh my for gosh. bonuses, wow. yeah. That's See, like... Very selfless. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Absolutely. <laughs> but, okay, so I have not actually seen the movie yet, but have you, any of you guys seen it yet? No, I have not. Oh, oh we, we gotta hear the lowdown. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, the theater was, it was like a whole other concert watching um, the movie. And there were six-year-olds in front. I thought that was funny. I was like, Aww. you weren't even alive when she released <laughs> yeah. her debut album. But that just shows how much of an impact she has. I mean, these six-year-olds are listening to all of her music. But it was amazing. I My mom went with me. She dressed up as Lover. Um, but, I mean, it was amazing. I was singing the whole time. I actually was lucky enough to go to um, one of the Air Store shows. So it was like reliving that moment. It was, I mean, it was amazing. It, it was I loved it. What secret songs did you get? Oh gosh, what did I get? I had or two. I songs. had two fearless songs. I had um, mine was the Mother's Day so show. So we had Best Day and Hey Steven. Oh, that's so, so sweet. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it was amazing. So for those of us who are like uh, waiting to see it, or like for viewers who are excited to see it, what can they expect? Like behind the scenes or mostly concert stuff? It's mostly concert stuff. It was one of the um, LA shows at SoFi Stadium and it was basically just the entire concert. It was a little um, less, it was about two hours and 45 minutes, the movie. Um, and the actual concert is uh, just over three hours, so a couple of the songs were cut out. Um, and obviously the transitions in between each era was different, mm -hmm. but it was it was just like watching the concert. Like you feel like you were there, you see fans, um, you're up and close with Taylor. I mean, it's perfect. 
Yeah, I'm I have to go see it. Oh, you absolutely yeah, I have to. <laughs> I'm just glad that she actually released a film because I know how big this whole tour was. So yeah. people that couldn't afford to go can <laughs> see it too. for uh, ten dollars and, and a bag of popcorn. So that's <laughs> yeah. very good. Absolutely. absolutely. So speaking of that, the Taylor Swift economy. I mean, just the movie alone in pre-sale, it made a hundred million, and that was just before and. Because of that, the whole movie was released a day earlier. It was supposed to be released on the 13th, but mm -hmm. sales were so great, she was like, no, the 12th. So. <laughs> I was blown away. I mean, it had a $98 million opening weekend. You know, mm -hmm. that's second behind the Joker for October weekend releases. Mm -hmm. And that movie just came out a few years ago to a ton of acclaim. And it's just amazing to see what a force a concert movie can have, especially when it's helmed by one of the most popular artists um, on the planet right now. Mm -hmm. And I actually looked into some of the statistics of it, and the in, the female audience for the weekend at theaters was 82%, which is just incredible, and it goes to show her appeal. Um, I think it was just amazing. Just so, so amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it even beat out Michael Jackson's concert mm -hmm. movie as well. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely... And that's saying something. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> this might be kind of odd to say, but I think... I wish she still released it on the 13th because everything that she does mm -hmm. is so significant and there's some kind of head, hidden um, Easter egg. Easter egg, thank you. <laughs> so uh, October 13th is very significant for her, so I kind of wish she kept it that way, but I mean, you got to give the people what, what, what they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the economics, it's like so interesting because like not only is this movie like generating so much, but like even her tour, what it was like, um, according to the Washington Post, it's expected, like, well, there's a projection that it's supposed to boost the U.S. economy by 5.7 billion. Like, That's one insane. person. That's incredible. One person. That is insane, like, the reach that she has. And you have to keep in mind, one in four Taylor Swift fans were not able to go to her Eras tour this this past um, summer, whenever she was touring. I know, me included. Yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. um, and so you can't imagine, like, how many people might that be? They're all going to be flocking to theaters, and that you're exactly right. That ties into the economy of it, mm -hmm. and I just can't imagine what it's going to do. And you know, I wonder if a certain someone has flocked to the theaters yet, being Travis Kelsey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> has he gone? Let's talk about that. Definitely. Oh my gosh. Well, I don't think he went to the opening, and I. Some people were having a little issues about that, but to be fair, I think he was gearing up for the Chiefs game. <laughs> so, yeah. He does have a life. He does. That's true. That's true. Now, Wait. my initial thought was, how dare he? Like, <laughs> you're not there for this big like occasion, but when you put it into perspective, I understand. Yeah, he's a football player. We still got to keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. But I did think it was pretty awesome that the two of them appeared in the SNL cameo. Mm -hmm. Although it was super short, and I actually heard that they weren't even really supposed to be in it, but they were going to the show that night. So the writers were like, let's just write them in. So, I mean, of course you got to put them in. Because the segment about the Travis and Taylor, it was super funny. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for someone to be in there. Mm -hmm. yeah, did any of you watch the premiere for SNL this weekend? I did. I, I really liked it. I, th I think um, they captured everything quite nicely, mm -hmm. especially with the whole Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey stuff. So it was funny. Yeah. I love mm -hmm. the puns. Can yes. Get <laughs> the Can't get enough of them. Yeah. I'm definitely gonna have to go back and rewatch that because I did not get a chance to. But yeah. Pete Davidson did a very nice job. I'll oh just my, say that. Wait, he's back, right? He's back. He was yep. hosting this week. week. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. I I definitely have to watch then. What? Mm -hmm. Like. <laughs> well, yeah, and then also we have Taylor Swift 1989 Taylor's version coming out on the 27th. So let's just talk quickly about that. Go. We'll go around super quick. Say our favorite song that we're looking to hear. Taylor's version of. Okay, so it already re released, but Wildest Dreams is my favorite of all time. That's like one of my favorite Taylor Swift songs in general, but I know it's, a, I know it's already come out, but you know, that, uh, and I believe it was This Love they were, that was re released too, it was, um, those served as a little bit of a precursor to her announcement of um, 1989's release, and I'm so, so excited to hear the rest of the track. I'm really, really excited to hear the songs from The Vault. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just so excited, what else? I'm super excited for Style. I think mm. it's just such a bop. I mean, I've got the red lip on. Like, I just, it's, I mean, everybody knows the song. It's a classic, and I'm just so excited to hear it and so proud that it's hers now. Yeah, definitely. I'm a big Wild, Wildest Dreams gal as well, and then also Welcome to New York. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very good one as well. I'm going to go with Jake here with the, uh, the vault tracks. I always look forward to those, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's going to be a, a pretty good ones on there. 
I'm right with you with quality <laughs> streams. <laughs> and um, I have to say blank space. I mean, like, oh, I used to one. listen to that, what, in middle school, high school? I'm going to listen to it again. It's mm. so good. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, that is all we have time for today. Tune in next time to hear all of the latest pop culture and entertainment right here. Back to you, Neela. Thanks, Courtney. I think we can all agree that Taylor Swift will forever be iconic. I can't wait to get my popcorn and watch Taylor's new movie. Stay tuned to hear all about the five worst horror tropes up next. This is why girls always go to the bathroom together. Exactly. My Always, when I'm at a party, I'm always thinking there's a killer come after me. That's why I go to the bathroom. The logical, logical reason. No other yeah. reason. Yeah. I'm Yaya Wan, and today I'm joined by Eva Hines, Becca Cohen, and Jackson Tortone. Spooky season is upon us, which means it's time to sit back, relax, and put on your favorite horror movie. As many gems as the horror genre has given us, I think we can all agree that horror movies can get predictable fast. So let's flip the script and get into the top five worst horror tropes. So, coming up at number five, we have splitting up. We've all seen those Scooby-Doo memes. I mean, mm -hmm. I can just imagine everybody sitting at the at either the movie theater or at home saying, no, don't split up, don't split up. <laughs> so let's talk about it. What movies have you guys seen this trope in? I'm going to start with Jackson. Okay, so I think the best example of just the stupidity of splitting up in a horror movie is from the film Terrifier, which is shown right here with Art the Clown. So, Two girls go to a little Halloween party, have some drinks we won't mention, and one of them has to go to the bathroom, right? So mm -hmm. she decides, I'm going to split with my friend, go into a creepy apartment by myself, while my other mm -hmm. friend goes to the car by herself while this clown has been stalking us all night. Mm -hmm. This this clown right here. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So they split up, and I think you know the rest of the story, what mm -hmm. happened. This is why girls always go to the bathroom together. Exactly. Yes. My, always. When I'm at a party, I'm always thinking there's a killer clown. After me, that's why I go to the bathroom. The logical, times. logical reason. No other yeah. reason. Yeah. But another great example of this is in Fright Night, when the two main characters split up while they're looking for the coffin of a vampire, which you would think, if you're hunting a vampire, maybe you should stay with your friends. I don't know. And then, of course, eventually, one of them confronts the vampire alone. Right. I think we all know Let's Split Up always leads to everyone being picked off one by one. But I think another good example is the movie A Cabin in the Woods. And it's kind of a parody on all these cliches. And in the movie, they all say at the beginning, we're not going to split up, we're not going to split up. And through like kind of a mind warping, they hear like a voice. Mm -hmm. And it says, you guys should split up, you guys should split up. And they're kind of mocking the splitting up for no reason parody. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There really is never any reason to split up. No. with your friends, especially if you're facing somebody with a very large knife. <laughs> right. So Absolutely. Yeah. let's head on to so. the next trope, yes. and that's blondes dying. So as somebody who is currently blonde, I take <laughs> great offense to this trope. Um, yeah. And maybe one day we can get into how it's rooted in sexism. But for now, let's just talk about how it's overplayed. Mm -hmm. So Becca, my fellow blonde. So my first thought was Tina, A Nightmare from Elm Street. She was the first character to be killed off, and I think it just shows how classic it is for a blonde to die. Obviously, it's so many people die in this movie, but they want to do it with like the classic dumb blonde character first, just to give it that like deep-rooted horror effect. Mm -hmm. and, and remind us who survived that movie again. Mm -hmm. It was a character who was not blonde, a girl who was not blonde. Mm -hmm. So. I know, I'm feeling pretty lucky because I got the brown hair, so I'm yep. feeling kind of grateful. But another example is the movie Halloween, and in the literal like opening scene, Annie Brackett is driving to her boyfriend's house, and she gets killed from the back seat of the car. And it's like literally in the opening scene, she is of course blonde, and I think that's just another example um, of that trope. So my example has got to be Scream, because Scream literally likes, to plays, or literally likes to play on the stereotypes of horror movies. So, of course, you have Sydney and you have Tatum. Tatum is the blonde. Tatum acts dumb the entire movie, mm -hmm. acts arrogant around the serial killer situation that they're in, and she ends up being strangled by a garage door. And Sydney ends up living and taking on the killers. So, stereotype is fully in display there. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. I think that has a lot to do with just the stereotype of girls being dumb in general. So, they right. try to, like, make it even more stereotypical by making them blonde, but it's actually just... Uh, any character dying in general. Right. right. And at this point, it's kind of overplayed. So I've seen, you know, in 
that's mostly in, like the classic horror movies. Mm -hmm. I've seen kind of like a move away from that, but definitely something that we see a lot. Mm -hmm. um, now our next one, let us talk about the creepy children. So mm -hmm. I am, I have a lot to say about this one because mm -hmm. I don't like this trope at all. It mm -hmm. makes me want to cry. But <laughs> Eva, go ahead yeah. and talk to us about creepy kids. Yeah, I feel like kids kind of like in horror movies symbolize like possession or like ghosts or in some creepy mm -hmm. way. But my example is actually the movie The Orphan. And it's a nine year old girl who gets adopted by a family and then she turns out to be a third, 33 year old serial killer and she's just like a whole menace. So I think mm -hmm. that's very, very scary and creepy. Mm -hmm. My example is the Grady twins in The Shining. I think they're the picture perfect classic two twins standing at the end of the hallway. You know, the youthful like creepiness that we're all terrified of. And I think in this movie, they just do like a great way of exemplifying what it is to be scared of children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I actually agree with Becca. I think that the twins from The Shining are the best example, but I'd also have to say Isaac and Malachi from The Children of the Corn. Mm. I would, I mean, this is a terrible thing to say, but I would beat those kids oh. off with, with oh, that, probably. I don't think I, you should say that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> those so, kids were serial killers, just, yeah. just, just to clarify. Right. We're going to move on to our second trope, and that is twist endings. Everybody likes a good twist, but when it's predictable, when you can see it coming from a mile away, it's not that effective. So let's talk twist endings. Becca? Um, my example is The Stepford Wives. This is such a classic movie. And I think the whole idea behind twist endings is that the whole time you're thinking that you're understanding what's going on, but then the idea of being scared is that it's a completely different scenario. So in The Stepford Wives, it's kind of this creepy ambiance of all these women kind of being submissive to their husbands but they're actually robots and they were murdered by their husbands the whole time. Mm. Yeah. Mine is actually the example we see here, the movie The Sixth Sense. I think it has one of the biggest plot twists of any horror movie and it's, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it, but Bruce Willis's character is actually dead the entire time and I think that's, no one was seeing it coming back in the day, so yeah. don't mm -hmm. have to say that. I want to jump in and say also Scream with the first one with the main character's boyfriend and his best friend actually being, um, Mask, mask face. My personal favorite as well, yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, and that's the reason why every time I watch a movie, I'm like, the boyfriend did it. Um, <laughs> yep, next, there go. last one, which is bad decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's awesome. like opening Every, up yeah. a Ouija board when you know that you don't want to communicate with that dead spirits. Jackson? The worst one's got to be Jeepers Creepers. I mean, if you're getting tailgated by a creepy guy in a raincoat, the last thing you want to do is drive up to the pipe that he dumps a body off in. <laughs> instead of driving away, looking down the pipe and then diving into it. Absolute right. worst decision ever. That's all we have for today. Next time you put on your favorite scary movie, see if you can spot some overused tropes. Back to you, Neela. Also, if you take a look at this picture, you notice the shadows are different because if it was filmed on Earth, they wouldn't be parallel. Yeah. Which is interesting as well. Welcome back to Nini Talk. Don't know if it's just me, but I feel that when I hear about a conspiracy theory, even once, it seems to stay in my mind for practically forever. Let's hear all about the most interesting conspiracy theories in our next segment. Thanks, Neela. Conspiracy theories are something that have always been around, but do some theories seem a little too real? My co-host, Charlie Krakowski, Ryan Lowey, and I will be discussing what we think are some of the most intriguing stories. Now, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Charlie. Yeah, and I got a big one. Uh, as you can see on the monitor, we have a picture of the Mandalay Bay uh, Hotel, which was the subject, or I should say hideout, of the Las Vegas shooter in 2017. Now, a little bit of backstory. The Route 91 uh, Music Festival took, right across, uh, took place right across the street at the fairgrounds, and uh, 58 people died. For perspective, that is the biggest mass shooting in the history of the United States. So uh, that's what really strikes me as when the uh, FBI investigated uh, the Sandy Hook shooting, uh, they were able to produce uh, 1,500 documents about the shooting. When they investigated the Las Vegas shooting, which killed more people, they were only able to produce three, three documents. That's Not to mention, Shooter had no motive, or at least the FBI couldn't find one. And the FBI is known for finding the motives of, you know, 
every little petty murder. Um, That's great. You just pointed a gun at me on camera. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but there a lot of other things aside. Uh, many, like the FBI says this was a one-man job when uh, you can see in videos there are muzzle flashes coming from the sky implying that there were helicopters in the area, you know, shooting as well. Um, if you checked the, uh, what's it called, the flight thing that tracks all the flights uh three helicopters were in the area and they just magically turned off their uh transmitters hmm. uh about 10 minutes before the shooting mm. yeah it's not a good look that's unfortunate timing I would have yeah to say. um what else do i have on here um police came out when they first broke into the door and they found him they said that they witnessed the uh shooter uh how do i say this off himself uh, but later, Commit yes, okay. I'm just trying not to be blunt, but, uh, they, uh, later redacted that statement and said, no, we found him dead. So which one is it? Yeah, that's also it's, it's, it's pretty, good. it's, it's, it's pretty tricky. Um, not to mention they found multiple pairs of gloves. Why would you need to wear gloves if you were just going to off yourself anyways? Uh, they found multiple cell phones. They found multiple key cards for multiple rooms in the hotel that were all, used within 30 minutes mm. of the actual shooting. Mm. Very strange. They found the guy's laptop, no hard drive in it. Where'd that go? That would be helpful for finding a motive that just wasn't found by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I feel like the PR teams who cover this, they do a good job, but then you lo start looking into it, and then it starts to just not make sense when it comes to some of these things. Now, I don't know if that's because of what information is released versus not, but I'm going to go off of what you were saying and move right. on to the Maui fires conspiracy, um, basically saying that they were planned by the United States government and by BlackRock Company. Now, why I'm bringing this up right after you is because the police chief of Maui was also the same police chief or sheriff of Las Vegas which is where the shooting was for your um, yeah, idea. Yeah, and he yeah. lived in Vegas for 20 years, but yes. he magically moved to Hawaii? My oh. question is, first of all, I, from my understanding, cops are not paid that well in Nevada. How do they afford to mm -hmm. live in Hawaii? I don't know. The timing is a bit odd. So he was the police chief or sheriff in Las Vegas for two decades, 20 years, and the massacre was in... 2017. Now, he doesn't move to Maui in 2017. No, he waits until 2021 to move to Maui. That's one thing that's like a little bit suspicious. Now, I have a lot of other things, and I'll give you just a little rundown, basically, of a bunch of things that are all coincidental but seem a mm. bit odd. So another thing is going to be all, all the locals, they had all their houses burned down to the ground, um, but all the millionaires and billionaires with properties were left untouched. Like now, Oprah, yes. right? Oprah was one of them. Now, out of all of the other, the locals whose houses did not burn down that were able to stay in their house, they were just convicted. Not convicted, but they were, um, uh, what's the word? Evicted. evicted. They were evicted, evicted from their properties. Evicted from their homes. Yes, so they were evicted. They couldn't have, if their house didn't burn, they were evicted. Exactly. Sounds so, like a really weird way of pulling off an eminent domain situation. Yeah, oh. it's a bit it's a bit interesting. Now, in addition to that, Maui is home to the largest um, the largest fire drills. All of the alarm systems, it's going to be the largest in the entire world. So they're really so good at those the fire alarm protocol. drills should be going off. They also oh. don't have the best transportation system in America by mm -hmm. far. That is not the case. Now, at the same time, those alarms with the fire going on, did not ring once, as well as the water was completely turned off. Why was the water turned off, do you know? Just no the water. water. was It was something a government issued, I guess, but the water was completely turned off. Now, Forgot another pay the water bill. really weird thing is that three weeks before the fire started, they made an emergency proclamation about housing. Out of everything. They made an emergency proclamation about housing. The state? Um, Maui, it did, at least. Okay, the city. Okay. Yes. Now, there's just so much to unpack with this because that's not even... It's, yes, there's, there's so, that's so much to level. go into. 
Um, now, another big thing is, have any of you seen the media interview grieving parents, children? Media has been pretty. The media, excuse me, the media has been pretty busy. But no, I have not but seen. But not that. in I've, that way. They're coming yeah. the I've, fires. They're, they're, yeah. I've not. I've not seen. Nor, any media regarding victims. Yeah. Nor have say. they covered well, schools when school was yeah. actually canceled yeah. that day. That is and all the kids were at home for those fires. Well, this, it's, if this does just show, before we move on, when push comes to shove, it's always safe to live in the 48 states, Ben. A little easier to get places. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm saying. Yeah. Well, anyway, we were talking about conspiracy theories that, you know, do make sense. This one does not make much sense. The really? moon landing. There is the absolutely there's absolutely no way it was faked. Zero percent so chance it, it was faked. It happened. It happened. It happened. Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon. He stood there. He left retro reflectors there. So okay. if you were ever to shoot something, it would come right back at you. Okay. Also, if you take a look at this picture, you notice the shadows are different because if it was filmed on Earth, they wouldn't be parallel. Yeah. Which is interesting as well. Another thing I did see about that was the uh, boot print, like didn't like the boot prints in the actual image didn't right. actually match the boot mm -hmm. footprint that he was on the thing. But I don't know, they 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 could, they could do that on. It would have costed them more back in the day because this was in 1969 right. to make up a similar lighting structure to the moon than it would have actually cost them to go to the moon in the first place. Yeah. So it is so crazy for them to fake it that they might as well have just actually stepped on the moon. Yeah. Not only that, 400,000 people worked for NASA. They would have all had to have kept it a secret. Mm -hmm. Not only that, other countries, they right. caught the satellite footage right. of him being on the moon. Right. That includes Russia, who would be the first one on the boat of saying they faked it. Even they're saying it wasn't faked. Yeah, I think that was a big thing was people were confused about the timing of it. It was that right too, when the Soviet like, Union said, like, oh, we're going to go to the moon. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, we're on the moon. Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing I will say as a film major, CGI back in the, like, 1980s was terrible. Oh, it was awful. You want to tell me that this is CGI? No. Well, they there's theories. Needed, they they, they would have they needed some serious heavy strings to be pulling this Puppeteer, marionette. It would have around. cost. It would have costed the government hundreds of trillions of dollars to recreate the lighting structure that the moon offers, because the nearest lighting structure is the sun, which is ninety-three million miles away, which yeah. explains the unique shadows. Yeah. You can't replicate the sun in nineteen sixty-nine with technology. You could do it now, but you can't do it that even, long even ago. Even now, it don't look like that. Yeah, unless no. they were able to do things that the public wasn't aware of. Well, yes, but, but again, it, but that goes to the question of now? that goes to the question why of four hundred. Thousand employees keeping that a secret. Unless they're unaware that it is. They a secret. cannot possibly be unaware. They were all logged into the system. Fair enough. So Fair enough. my question is: Were four hundred thousand people able to keep a secret, or did that man land on the moon? I would say he landed on the moon, dude. Yeah, four hundred thousand people it. and Russia, because I, Russia logged in. Russia. I will say that one does seem more improbable than some of the others, but sadly. That's all the time that we have for today. These conspiracy theories definitely made us think a bit more about some events. Now, back to you, Neela. Thanks, Alexis. Well, a fake moon landing was the most interesting to me, and I am now definitely contemplating a lot of how I've seen the world so far. To end the show, we will hear all about the best makeup dupes you can find. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Something I notice is when you look up this um, foundation, this one pops up even before yeah. this one. So right. it just shows that it's such a good dupe for the product. Welcome back to Nini Talk. Personally, I feel that TikTok has a power over me, especially when someone advertises a makeup product. I just have to buy it. Can't wait to hear from this next segment discussing cheaper alternatives to your favorite makeup products on the market. Thank you, Neela. I'm Samantha Rascio, and today I am joined by Gigi Fuentes, Joy Donald, and Jordan Spagnoli to compare some of the, the most viral luxury makeup products and their cheaper alternative dupes. So first we're going to start off with the Tarte Shape Tape and Maybelline Concealer. Mm -hmm. um, I've personally tried these products, and I favor the cheaper alternative Maybelline. I think when it comes to luxury versus dupes, it really just depends on personal preference. But again, when you're in college, you're balling on a budget. So you kind of just got to figure out what works for you. But so yeah, the first products that we're talking about today, we have the Tarte Shape Tape Concealer, which sells for about $31, depending on where you get it from, versus our Maybelline Instant Age Rewind Eraser Multi-Use Concealer, which goes for about $9, again, depending on where you get it from. 
but I am a big fan of the Shape Tape. I have such bad dark circles, and I just feel like it definitely lightens up my under eye, and it lasts me all day long. For yeah. me, the Tarte Shape Tape really creases my okay. under eyes, um, so that's why this Maybelline's a little more lightweight, but also gives you that full coverage effect. Right, I think at least for concealers, it also depends on your skin type, mm -hmm. and for a lot of people, it can, be, it can vary. Um, but at least for the Tarte, in my opinion, I like how it's a thicker formula, and it also comes with different shades, um, so it just has that variety that I love. Yeah, I have to agree. I honestly, I think I'm team Shape Tape, only because it's a tried and true. I've been using it since like 2017. It's so, you really can't go wrong with the Shape Tape. Right. And I think you had a good point. It really does depend on your skin type. For some people with oily skin, it works better. For some people with dry skin, it mm -hmm. just... It comes down to personal preference, but I do think that we do have a pretty good dupe mm -hmm. for the Shape Tape Concealer, which takes us to our next products, the Charlotte Tilbury Ho Hollywood Flawless Filter, which it's not necessarily a foundation, but this retails for about $49, again, give or take on where you get it from, mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. our e.l.f. Halo Glow liquid filter, which is about $14, again, depending yeah. on where you get it from. Something mm -hmm. I want to notice is yeah. in the e.l.f., you get, I believe, a little bit more product mm -hmm. than what you get from the Charlotte Tilbury, and the price difference is just so dramatic. So you get one ounce here. Mm -hmm. Yes, that one's 1.6 ounce yeah, this ounces is 1. on the e.l.f. Yeah. 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 I'm a big yeah. fan of the e.l.f. one. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe it is a little bit more catered for oily skin. It's silicone yeah. based, which um, provides for a really good, mm -hmm. it like nice. it's nicely hydrating, but it also provides some of that dryness for if you have oily skin, which I really love since I have oily skin. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. something I notice is when you look up this um, foundation, this one pops up even before yeah. this one. So right. it just shows that it's such well, a good dupe for the product. And it's not, it's not a foundation either. I think mm -hmm. that's something that like I got confused whenever I was first looking into these products. This is either a good like standalone if you don't want a full face of coverage, or it just gives like that glowy natural finish. I want to say this has eight shades, whereas that has twelve shades. Um, again, I think it just depends on like how long it lasts. Whereas mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. usually for the more expensive products, you'll see a longer wear time than on the cheap products, but cheaper products I should say. But yeah. just like depending yeah. on what you need it for. You're only going to class and you're just like, oh, like let me just throw in a little bit of makeup. Again, it's a great replacement, whereas you may don't want to spend fifty dollars on yeah. the product. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to add really quick that just looking at it physically, you could you can see over here that's like aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. And then over here it's kind of a more subtle appearance. And I think if you're trying to aim for if you want to display it, it's like fancier for that product at least. But um so then our next products we're talking about, Charlotte Tilsber Tilbury mm -hmm. um, highlight wands like contour blush versus the e.l.f. Halo Glow beauty wands. Mm -hmm. Again, a pretty good dupe, very right. similar. Um, you look at the lasting time, but I don't know, you said you have the Halo Glow on I right do, now? yes. And then I have Charlotte Tilbury on, so I guess we've got a side-by-side <laughs> -side comparison here today. They both look great. Yeah, um, you can't thank really you. I think it really comes down to, again, wearability. Wearability, yeah. how long is it going to last you? But again, depending on what you're doing, mm -hmm. does it really matter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, the more expensive has two more shade options than the dupe option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something to notice. Mm -hmm. But a, a good for sensitive skin. I mm -hmm. know, like for me personally, I have super sensitive skin. So the more higher end products, they work better on my skin. Whereas sometimes the mm -hmm. dupes do cause me to break out. So that's another thing you have to think about whenever you're thinking about what's gonna be best for you and your skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I right. think for the Charlotte Tilbury at least, it's more a little bit more pigmented too. Um, so I think it just gives you that subtle appearance that you really want if you're trying to aim for these products. And yeah. then our last makeup product that we're actually gonna talk about is the Hula Bronzer, which we have this one here, and then a dupe for it, which a lot of people I have heard good things about is the Physician's Formula Butter Bronzer. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah. it depends on what you're trying to do with it. I feel like the Hula definitely goes on very um, smooth, and it blends. It's very blendable, very mm -hmm. buildable. Mm -hmm. has a long last. This is the kind of bronzer that I use. I personally love it. But I've also tried the other one. Again, I have sensitive skin, mm -hmm. so that one did cause me to break out a lot more than the Hula Beauty. Yeah. Right. And the Hula bronzer also has that matte finish that you really want. So I think that's a big difference from the creamy finish that you get and then the matte. I think yeah. it definitely, these dupes work really well and just depending on what your budget is, mm -hmm. 
this is a good alternative for some of the more luxury products. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, that is all we have for today. Makeup dupes are one of the best ways to save money on products. You can go to your drugstore and pick up some of your own makeup dupes to try. Back to you, Neela. Well, that's all we have for this week's episode. It's been great discussing all about the latest in politics and entertainment, listening to some of the worst horror tropes and intriguing conspiracy theories, and the best dupes to the most popular cosmetic products. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. For Nindy Talk, I'm your host, Neil Azami, and we'll see you next week.